Thanks, everybody. Thanks for, for being here and showing up. Um, topics to talk about, and I rarely get the opportunity, so this is pretty, pretty awesome for me. Um, I'm a, a postdoctoral uh, fellow at the Joint Institute for Marine and Atmospheric Research, which is the bridge institution between University of Hawaii and NOAA that allows us to collaborate between state and federal uh, entities. And um, I just started in August, and it's been incredibly productive. And I'll tell you a little bit about what we're doing later, but to start, we're going to get right into the most amazing group of animals that you probably have never seen. So the, the baby forms of fishes, the, the larval forms of most marine fishes, are some of the most incredible and bizarre animals um, on the planet. They're incredibly diverse, uh, but wrapped up in that diversity is a lot of similarities, even amongst really different types of fishes. There have been some very similar types of uh, adaptations and specializations that allow them to adapt to surviving in the marine environment. And that's a lot of what I'm going to uh, talk to you guys about tonight is some of the incredible adaptations that larval fishes, particularly the larval forms that the adults don't have, uh, that they've evolved. Like this little guy. This is a, uh, a larval dragonette. Uh, maybe you see them on, on some of the sandy uh, bottoms, a little bit deeper. This is a, a six millimeter, you could barely see it with your eye, uh, specimen. And um, they have really absolutely gorgeous. Uh, and I put this photo up particularly to point out the fact that um, there's a lot of images from a particular photographer that I'm going to present on today. And these are images from uh, Jeff Malison, who's a University of Hawaii alum. And uh, we studied ichthyology together. And he's now living in Kona. And he's probably the world's best blackwater photographer at this point, which is swimming out in the open ocean at night by yourself to photograph a lot of these things. So this image, along with a lot of others, are actually captured in C2. So they're, they're, they're actually out in open water and then luckily finding, running across some of these incredible creatures and being quick enough to photo photograph them and do it well. So um, I'll thank Jeff again at the end, but also in the beginning, because uh, he's really bringing this incredible beauty to life with his pictures, and uh, I'm really grateful for that. So most uh, spawn pelagic eggs, as in the, the males and females get together in these big spawning aggregations, and they release sperm and eggs that are externally fertilized, and then the eggs are just out floating in open ocean, and the babies are off to fend for themselves. And so this is the, the predominant reproductive mode in most marine fish, that there's the eggs and sperm, they're out releasing, and as soon as they're out there, they're getting predated on. <laughs> and then after that, they're developing from the eggs out by themselves without any parental care, and within a few days, they're hatching, and amongst hatching, within a couple days of that, they have to be completely self-sustainable. They have to learn how to eat, they have to learn how to avoid predators, multiple different kinds of predators coming at them from all angles. And the amount of mortality that happens in this stage is astounding. More than 99.9% .9 of all larvae that hatch die. What you see out here in Hanama Bay are the one in a million that, that survive. They are the sole survivors. Oh, let me go back there. And what I want to point out here is that not only do they survive, but they survive by going through a reality that's much different from mine or yours. So at these really small stage, stages, a couple of millimeters, average of two millimeters when they're born, which is barely the top of a pinhead, the water is so thick for that size of, of an organism that it'd be like us trying to swim through olive oil. It's really viscous. And the, the biochemical properties that are happening at this stage are much different than what you or I might experience. And to try to show that a little bit,
is a, a quick video of a larval form trying to swim at two millimeters in size. And you can see how thick the water is at that size. And it's just going to play again. So it creates this boundary layer all around it. So it, it's swimming through things that are much thicker than what we experience as water. And at being three days old, they have to be successful predators. And that boundary layer can be a, a huge problem. And not only do they have to survive, but they have to navigate the open ocean and then eventually find their way back to whatever habitat that they came from. So it's an incredible journey with really amazing challenges that they overcome. So when you see a juvenile fish or an adult fish on the reef, these are the sole survivors, the ones that have been through an amazing journey. Um, and what I hope to show you is, is some of the specializations that allow them to be able to do that. Now, imagine you're uh, a larval reef fish that was just hatched. Your yolk sac is rapidly diminishing maybe last you two days from being hatched out of the egg, and now you got to find your first meal. You also have to be able to avoid predators, which are coming at you from all angles. And you exist in this open, epiplagic part of the, the ocean. This is the top 100, 100 meters that has well-lit surface area, and there's lots of predators from all around. So the first thing is to not get eaten. And one of the best strategies for doing that is to remain small, and to try to hide from your hide from a predator in this kind of environment. There's nothing to hide under, there's nothing to hide behind. You have to try to be cryptic. And one of the best strategies that fish larvae have done to get around this is being transparent. And transparency, almost near invisibility, has evolved multiple independent times in many different fish families. So this is a very common trait uh, amongst fish larvae. This is a, uh, a swallower. Um, mesopelagic kind of deep water fish and but we also see it in some of the fish we're more familiar with like the surgeon fish where the back part of their bodies are almost completely translucent but some of them haven't completely lost pigment and if you look at this fish as if that eye is a fish coming up and down like this that might be a good way to avoid predators because where you're swimming in an escape response is a completely different direction of where a predator thinks you might be coming from. And some groups have evolved transparency to almost perfection where you can't see them at all. <laughs> but most of them still have, it's one of the best ways that you can find them, particularly when you're looking at them in samples, is that most of the body, like these eels, these moray eels are completely translucent. You can see right through them. Um, but there still is tiny little bits of pigment. And one thing I'll point out is the eye. So see how the eye is kind of oblong? That's another feature uh, in larval fish that's really different from any other animals. They've kind of specialized and adapted this eye morphology um, in ways that you wouldn't even imagine. So here's Here's some examples of uh, these elliptical eyes in lanternfish. Lanternfish are, are midwater fishes, really abundant all throughout the oceans, particularly out here in Hawaii. And they have this uh, narrowing of the eye that allows them to increase the field of vision around them. So as opposed to our, our eyes, which are very rounded and sunk into our heads, our field of vision is somewhat limited. But if you narrow that eye, you can actually increase the amount of water that you can scan at a particular time upwards of tenfold. And so that can be a huge advantage when you're looking for predators or looking for prey. But what's really cool is that these larval forms are all changed and lost in the adult forms. So the adults are on the right hand side there. So all of them look kind of similar and they all have that rounded eye in adults. So this specialization is only in the larval form. And if you look at this example of one of the lantern fish from both above and below, you can see that you can see some of that, that pupil from all of those directions. So these animals can look below them, can look above them, can look in front of them to the side all at the same time. So that's a major advantage when you can only see a couple centimeters in front of you. It's really helpful to be able to see a couple centimeters in multiple directions. But that trait is lost in the adults, and they just have the regular rounded eye that we're used to seeing in vertebrates. 
and this eye morphology can even change drastically within days. Uh, so this is the same species of hygophum landed fish that the eye morphology is going from elliptical to pointing backward to pointing <laughs> forward to going to really narrow, almost diamond shape, and then coming back into a, uh, a rounded form. Each one of these stages is about two days difference in, in development. So they're changing drastically. And within those days, as their bodies are shifting and changing like this, they still have to eat. So it's not like they can like take a break and change my eye structure. They're still, they're still living and surviving in their environment while these crazy changes are going on. More bizarre. So if it's beneficial to have an elliptical eye, it's also beneficial to have an elliptical eye out on a stalk. And so some of these fish, like in, in uh, the genus Mictophum, of land and fish have put out their eyes on, on these uh, pedunculate stalks that can be rotated. So you have an elliptical eye that increases your field of vision upwards of tenfold, and then you can move that around. Lack of skeletal structure around these things, it's actually just a slight mucus, suggests that they can freely rotate their eyes all around their head to get an almost 360 uh, field of vision. And you can see the whitest part of that is the head. And, Outside of that, surrounding the eyes is just a little bit of mucus and connective tissue. But then lost in the adults as they develop. And so this is just an adaptation for the, the larval form. To take that one step further, these idiocanthus uh, loose jaws have really ran with this idea. And their eye stalks are a quarter of the length of their own body. And as if that doesn't look bizarre enough, this is the adult form. So these are the barbel dragonfishes. Uh, they have these bioluminescent lures that they hang in front of their mouths to try to lure in prey. And they're really just amazing, um, amazing animals. Now these, so this is just a drawing of them, these, these kind of Jar Jar Binks wannabes, showing how that we're really not sure how the eye stalk is actually oriented when they're swimming. So we catch a lot of these, these dead organisms and we're not sure how they behave so that the eye stalks could uh, point up and they could point down, they could be forward or reverse. It's, it's part of their behavior that we haven't uh, had a glimpse into yet. So exactly how they're, how they're feeding, how they're using this, this incredible adaptation is still unknown. Another thing that we see, that we started to see in those, um, uh, those dragonfish is the extension of the gut. And like in these last two examples, you see that there's a little section of the intestines that sticks out here and a longer section here. So this is actually the anus that has become completely separated from the rest of the body. So they have an external part of the gut and the anus that's trailing behind them, what we might call a trailing gut. Some of them, it's very simple. So it's just kind of one more fold of the intestine that they've just left behind the body. And this might be a good way to increase nutrient absorption, to lengthen the gut, but actually to not have it be inside your body, to just have it be trailing outside. And when you need every single meal that you get, having a little bit better nutrient absorption can be a major benefit. But some of them have really elaborated on this where the, the gut length is about one size this yeah it can also aid in respiration yeah that's a great point it can also aid in respiration so i didn't mention that yet is that gas exchange is huge and at animals this small they can actually absorb oxygen through their bodies because they have so much surface area so these extended guts increase the surface area of their internal cells enough that they could actually still absorb gas without gills which can be incredibly helpful when you don't want to spend a lot of energy developing your gills if you can just absorb oxygen through the water. So yes, there's multiple benefits to, uh, to these structures. And then some have really gotten elongated. So this is um, a Malacostrachus uh, dragonfish that's gotten, uh, the gut is extended, it's about five times the length of its own body. And amazingly, uh, Jeff Malison has gotten pictures of these off of Kona here in Hawaii. So this is this is a uh, a loose jaw flashlight fish, 
And the body is here with the fins coming off. Here's the head and the eyes. And this is all the gut trailing back behind it. And then here's the anus back here. So it, it's extended its own body length multiple times over by having its intestines hang outside of their body. And even crazier than that is that they have these little photophores dazzled all around the, the part. So that Jeff actually called this uh, butt dazzled. So these, they're, they're bedazzled. And they, ha they have a little bit of a reddish hue, he said, which makes sense because these are... Um, are stoplight loose jaws, which I'll show you guys in a second. And they produce a little bit of red light, which most organisms in the ocean can't see. And the reason this is adaptive is because the adults, this is a drawing of an adult here. This is the, the uh, stoplight loose jaw eating a mctophid. And they have these red light producing photophores right in front of their eyes that creates a flashlight. Now, most can't see red light because it's it's the first wavelength to disappear with depth. So if there's not much red in the ocean, why evolve a system to see it? But these guys did. And so they actually have a flashlight that's produced right in front of their eye that produces light that nothing else can see. So it's like shining an infrared light all around you to hunt, but your prey can't see it. And so this, this has been one of my favorite fish for a long time. Uh, I love this drawing. And in this past cruise uh, in September, we actually caught both of those species in a, in a cob trawl, and I recreated that drawing in, in person. And uh, they took a picture of me. I was so excited. To look at <laughs> but those things are, there's amazing things, stuff out there. And everything I've shown you thus far is found here in Hawaii, not, not more than a couple hundred yards offshore of Phnom Bay right here. So we went out at night here and did an open water dive, we'd see a lot of these things, which is truly remarkable. Elaborating on that trailing gut are the, uh, the cusp eels, um, which have kind of taken it in a whole new direction. So we've got, this is the gut here that's taken a loop and has been wrapped around in a fin fold. This one has gotten even further, but all these, the the structures are all lost in the adult forms, which are really this kind of drab, slightly ugly looking um, cuscules that are at deeper depths. Now the function of this has astounded people for a while exactly trying to figure out what, what benefits this might have. And one of the most elaborations is, is in this Lampogramus, which is also a cuscule, how it has the, uh, the trailing gut followed by this elaborate tree-like appendage that's an extension of their pectoral fins and these crazy splayed out uh, dorsal rays with little bits of yellow pigment all around them. And we think that they probably mimic uh, siphonophores or, or possibly comb jellies that have these also uh, kind of structures. And so these, these images are, are incredibly valuable for trying to get into a look at how these organisms actually are behaving in the environment. But one of the, the uh, advancements in this field of, of being able to study things in the ocean is uh, ISIS, believe it or not, which is the uh, in situ ichthyoplankton imaging sampler. And this machine was developed before the Islamic State came around, so the acronym is, is unfortunate. Uh, but this machine, instead of collecting plankton with a net, which is how most of our samples come from, when they get caught in nets, they get destroyed, slightly damaged, and then they're just sitting dead in a jar, and we're trying to figure out how they live and how they, they work. This really cool machine uses uh, an incredibly high-resolution scanner, just like a Xerox scanner, but at within a micron resolution to scan what's in the water column as opposed to collect it. And then we get these amazing images of organisms actually oriented how they would be in, in the wild. And what is that not just the morphology, but also the orientation and the behavior is mimicking a lot of these um, siphonophores and noxious jellyfish and hydromedusa, things that are really abundant and are not very palatable to eat. 
So they're great things to try to mimic. And so here on the right are two examples of um, a grouper that have these really elaborate uh, dorsal rays that come out that probably mimic the, mimic the comb jellies. And here we have some of the, the cusk eels, which when viewed with uh, that kind of transparency in mind and this kind of low resolution acuity, which most organisms have, not the, the really good eyes that we have, but with this kind of slightly duller resolution, they really do look like these salps, um, particularly in silhouette. And so that, that little dorsal ray that sticks out is potentially mimicking the, the extension of, of the, the house of the salps. This goes even further, the, the eel larva, this is a moray eel, looks just like a, um, a coleoid tenophore. And they have this wrapping behavior where they coil themselves up, also just like salps when they do that. And so this is, this is a behavior that we've never seen before because we just collect it with a net and we can't actually see how it's, it's out there swimming. But a lot of these things are coiled up. And particularly the, the flatfishes, the flounders, are coiled up so much and they leave their dorsal and anal rays out to probably look like these um, uh, these hydromedusa, these these uh, poisonous jellyfish. And so what we thought actually swam out extended, they're completely wrapped up in a cylinder like that to try to look like jellyfish. And then we also have some. Um, these are uh, anchovies that are mimicking the vertical swimming behavior of ketignaths, which are crazy abundant arrowworms that are all over the place. And this might be a predatory strategy or pre perhaps a way to avoid predation because instead of being a nice, easy to see silhouette of a fish shape, you swim up and down and don't look as much like a fish. And so this behavior we'd never. And these elaborate ray extensions can get quite elaborate. Uh, these are two little little basslets that have incredibly elongated um, dorsal fin rays. Doesn't get much more elaborate than this. This is a, a little basslet. This is the whole fish right here, and these are all the extended dorsal rays that look a lot like a jellyfish being the bell up here, and each one of these nodules being the nematocyst, the little poisonous harpoons that fire out. And one of my favorites, this is a, a larval oarfish. So the oarfish those real long looking things. You've seen people pull up on the beach and they say this is a weird looking alien. Why they're about four form. Some of them have these nodules that look a lot like um, the comb jelly and uh, jelly nematocyst. Incredibly elaborate and beautiful. I had to carve out a little bit of time for the the pearlfish, which nasty buggers. They they parasitize the um, track, the butt of sea cucumbers and a lot of sea stars. And so, as larvae, they crawl into the butt and then hang out in these sea cucumbers, where they uh, make a living and live there their entire lives. So, these little Anal intruders are kind of a pain for, for sea cucumbers, um, but the larval forms are really, really weird. So this one up top has an extended dorsal ray that is bent forward and might be used as a, a lure. And the one below seems to have um, an extended trailing gut as well that's paired with a dorsal spine that might make it look bigger or somehow it completely changes the axis of the body. And it, this one is, is still quite a mystery. And amazingly, people have photographed it out in the water. This is the head. Here's the body. This is the trailing gut. And here's an elongated dorsal spine that's more than 20 times the length of the body. It's really amazing. And it does look like a jelly. It certainly seems possible that the, the function of this could be in mimicry. And here's one that Jeff Melison shot in Hawaii. Uh, 
seeing how long that extended trailing gut is in that extended dorsal ray. So these structures can be just quite amazing and then lost in the adult form where they're just are hanging out in butts. <laughs> My favorite little mysteries is the um, the stalked fins in, in rat tails. Rat tails are, are chimeras, they're also called, are, are really abundant in kind of deep deeper sea, uh, shallow, sh or deeper slopes. And they have this, their pectoral fin is actually out on a stalk, as you can see here. So it's as if, kind of like us, how our hands are out on these long appendages. This is the only fish known to man that has an extended pectoral fin. And the function of which is, is not known at all. So it's very, there's still these very weird specializations that we're not quite sure what they do. So the, uh, this next part is all about spines. Spines have been um, an incredibly important evolutionary theme in, in larval fishes. And they've come up with many different ways to make themselves both pokey and choky for predators. And um, they've actually evolved an incredible ability to metabolize um, calcium and then mobilize it in ways that no other organism on the planet has been able to do. So at a few days old, they can suck calcium out of the water, move it into their bodies, and build these elaborate structures um, to try to avoid predation. Uh, does anyone know what, what these are? How about this top one? So they got a, a long snout that's trying to come out here. And this is a larval form of a blue marlin that will grow up to be very big. And they have these um, little spines that come off of their gill plates, really sharp teeth and this huge eye. And this one here is the sunfish. Yeah, yeah, that's the sunfish. So it's the larval form of the mola mola, or the, the ocean sunfish. These are two of the biggest organisms that have uh, really bizarre and very small larvae when they're born. These are uh, two examples of squirrel fish that show the, the different head shields and, and spines that they have. This is a huge bony structure that's surrounded all around. Look how big that eye is in relation to the body size. And so you can see how these, these could be an anti-predation uh, mechanism to try to make themselves bigger. You see a lot of spines that are on the edges of the gill plate because the gill plate is flexible. So as they stretch out their gill plate, they can make themselves bigger, potentially harder to swallow. And then some, like in the surgeon fish and in the groupers, they've elaborated really long, elaborate dorsal spines, many of which are serrated, uh, like they are on the right-hand side. And so you can see that this could you know, increase the size of your body so that you're less likely to get eaten by something that would have to swallow you. Now we're going to come back to spines, uh, so remember that, but we'll move on for the moment to uh, the last specialization that I'll talk about, which is these really bizarre gelatinous sacs. And there's really no better word for it. Uh, these are the puffers and the box fishes have these, and also the angler fish, which are very closely related. And we're really not sure exactly what they do. Um, they could have a, a hydrostatic function, but they could help them maintain buoyancy because they're kind of, jelly is usually a little bit lighter, so it could help you uh, stay afloat and stay buoyant. And it could also be an energy saving mechanism, like you could store energy in there. Um, but it's never been tested, so it's it's still a mystery exactly what these these big sacs um, do. This is a uh, a larval uh, anglerfish that is completely surrounded by this gelatinous material. Very bizarre. And here's another anglerfish that has kind of moved on from that idea and has just completely surrounded itself with these tiny little hair-like projections called Siri. 
and they're lost in the adult, which looks like this. They're a type of a toadfish or, or benthic anglerfish. But the function of this in the larval form is still a complete mystery. Now, a mystery that I want to highlight that was actually solved. Um, this is one of the coolest examples that I could think of of how confusion or how confusing a lot of this can be when you're trying to make sense of, of these different things that come up. So this organism here is called a tape tail, this really long, stringy, elaborate thing like we saw in some of the other examples. Each one of these were classified into a different family. But genetics and some more advanced um, morphological analysis showed that they're actually all the same organism. The top is the larval form. This is the male and this is the female. So we, we had previously categorized them into three different families, completely different organizations. Um, and so this is just to show how, how complicated it can be when the larvae are so different from the adult form when you're trying to link up what's, what's the baby and what's the adult. It can be incredibly challenging. And, and that's because they're existing in completely different environments. The larval form is experiencing a whole different environment than the adult is. Because the adults could be going back to the reef, they could be going down to sandy bottoms, they could be going to the abyss. Larval forms are all existing in the same part of the water column. So the, the selective pressures and the constraints are very different. And this is one of those whalefish larvae uh, that Jeff Lyson photographed uh, off of Kona. And this is the first time we've ever been able to see that they can actually retract that elongate anal ray, or not anal ray, but uh, back of the caudal ray in this one. So in that example, it's already splayed out. And then they can actually pull that back and retract. Yeah. The fish that have been gelatinous sacs around, they uh, look at the chemical composition to see if there's anything live in there that might be energy producing microbes and things like that. That's a, a really good question. I know that um, uh, th there's the gelatinous sacs that we showed in the, um, the anglerfish and the puffers, if they have a particular biochemical um, signature that could tell us what their function is. And the short answer is no. I'm, I'm not sure of anyone that has looked at that. Um, they're mostly water, but the particular compounds... Yeah, exactly. So are you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I think, as far as I know, no one's really nailed that down yet, but it, it should be something that we should look at. So, when you have a biphasic lifestyle like we have in most marine fishes, where the larval form is doing their thing, the adult form is doing their thing, you can get conflict. And with conflict can come some really interesting um, solutions. So when the larval form is trying to evolve towards being elongate, being translucent, having this kind of eye, having a trailing gut, and then the adult form is trying to survive a completely different environment. Picture they're living on a coral reef, completely different. So sometimes those different morphologies can conflict with one another. And because the larval form, yeah? Does the uh, adult form ever eat the larval form? Uh, of like the same species? Yeah. Good question. Um, not that I'm aware of, but I wouldn't discount it. Uh, there's definitely cannibals between species. So like this larval fish would eat a different larval fish of the same genus or something like that, but I'm not sure if they ever do it within species. But I wouldn't be surprised if they did. I mean, it's pretty cutthroat out there. Um, and so because there's so much of a strong selective pressure on the larval phase, where 99% of them can die, even a slight advantage in the larval phase can be really beneficial for that species. And so the larval form can sometimes start to override the adult form. And when that happens, we get these really bizarre outcomes um, where the larval form actually wins out and there's no longer an adult. It's just, it stays a larva throughout its whole life period. And these are called patomorphic or, or neotenic. And this is a great example with anglerfish where the anglerfish looks a lot like the larval anglerfish instead of transforming into an adult that lives a completely different lifestyle. They're just like, you know, we figured it out. 
we're just going to stay larval forms and forget about that. And what's even crazier is that this is the male attached right there. So this is all the female, and this is the male they call them parasitic males, which they attach and they just transfer sperm to the females. And so you only need to find a mate once, and then you're attached literally at the hip. <laughs> yeah. Where do you see them? Um, a, a lot of them you can see right here off, offshore in Hawaii. A almost every example that I've shown so far has been seen in Hawaii, which is amazing. Yeah. And um, deeper, and some of them are actually like right at the surface uh, during the early larval stages. And so even though the adults are in completely different habitats on the reef, down at the bottom of the ocean, down on the slopes or in sandy bottoms, the, the larvae are actually all intermixing in the shallow surface waters just offshore of here. And is that size? No, they're, they're, these are oh, okay. tiny. Most of, the, most of this stuff is really, really small. Very blown up for this. Yeah. Sure. Did the male attach itself to the they do so they start out separately males and females and then once they find each other even if the female is not in estrus even if she's not ready to produce eggs the male latches on with a small tooth a specialized tooth and then he actually fuses to the female so his skin literally becomes mixed in with female and then his sperm duct just connects in with her with her body and he's basically just then a sperm producing sack and he never leaves after that, believe it or not. It is, it is amazing. Yeah. Uh, uh, sorry, I already made this clear. But the, so the, these neo-neo-tenic fish, uh, is it just specific individuals with human species? So this is like some weird thing that happens one in a hundred times? Or this is like an entire species becomes replaced by the larval form. The latter, yeah, it's an entire species. Um, so instead of, yeah, at one point a species branched off and instead of metamorphosing, instead of metamorphosing into the adult, they lost that and just became their own species. So the entire species changed where it lived in the ocean. Like before, maybe it was like a few hundred, like a hundred feet down and now it's just lives up in that like top part of the water. The, yeah. The larval stage stayed the same, and instead of then dropping to 100 meters or 1,000 meters and becoming an adult, they're just like, I'm just going to stay doing what I was doing. I figured it out. I got a solution. And then, yeah, they became eventually their own separate species. The offspring of the larval form, uh, does that mean that revert back to the original form when the offspring stays that way? Yeah, the offspring, the, the larva sort of stay looking like the 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 other yeah exactly yeah so they, they looking really different from the adults in these cases they actually look really similar it just kind of looks like a growth uh, as opposed to a crazy metamorphosis and this uh, neoteny or pedomorphosis has become incredibly extreme in one group of fishes that we find right here in Ham Bay called the, the infant fish. So that individual there that's um, encased in plastic is an adult. And right there in the drawing are the both the top of the female and below the or top of the female below the male um, form of the infant fish called Shillaria. And they just completely did the same thing. They got rid of the the adult form and just stayed as larva. And they're, based on mass, they're the smallest vertebrates on the planet at less than an inch long. Some people have found shorter frogs and they got a bunch of attention in the media as being the smallest because they're shorter, but they're really stout. So based on mass, these guys are the smallest vertebrates on the planet. And really cool because you can see them snorkeling actually very few. They're one of the most common and abundant organisms on the reef, but they're super tiny, so they're really hard to see. You can only really see them when they're in big schools 
but you can see them frequently snorkeling out here um, around anywhere around the state. If you see a big school of like tiny little fish that look like larva, like they're coming in to settle, they could be full grown adults of, uh, of Shillaria. So just to give a quick recap of kind of the amazingness of what we've been talking about is that the, the majority of marine fishes are hatched as these tiny little eggs and within a few days have to be completely self-sufficient, learn how to hunt, learn how to evade predators, navigate the open ocean and, and survive. And most of them don't because of, there's so many dangers and so many struggles when you're this small, but a lot of them do. And in fact, the, we used to think that they were these kind of really passive, um, not very, you know, we didn't think they had very good senses, they can't smell, they can't see very far, they're just kind of floating around in the open ocean wherever they get caught in the currents is where they end up. And within the past couple decades, we've learned a lot more about how they're able to actually find their way back to natal reefs. And so a lot of these can actually navigate the open ocean, disperse for hundreds of kilometers, float around offshore for three weeks or a month, and then actually find their own reef that their, their parents spawn them at. And that hints to a lot of amazing sensory capabilities within these organisms that are a few days or a few weeks old. So it turns out they have pretty, pretty capable hearing. They can actually hear. If, if this is the coral reef fish, this is an example of the butterfly fish. They can actually hear the reef, hear all the reef sounds. And when they're swimming around the open ocean, they can cue into it and try to orient towards that coral reef in order to find their way back to where they came from. They have really advanced um, olfactory senses or, or the ability to smell what's in the water. So they can cue into very particular smells uh, that might indicate that a coral reef is over here or a sandy bottom is over here. And on top of that, they have a magnetic compass. That they can actually sense magnetism. This has been found in, in a few species. I'm not sure how, how uh, extended that is amongst other fish, but at least in a few species, they can sense the magnetic field. And then the most amazing thing to me is that these small sizes, they're really good swimmers, uh, which I find really, really surprising and quite, quite impressive. So this guy is about a, a mill or a centimeter long, which is tiny. And at that size, they can swim about 20 to 30 centimeters a second, which is about this big. But if you control for their body length, that would be like us swimming 100 miles an hour through olive oil. <laughs> because at that size, the, viscous, the viscosity of the water is, is so great. And they can do that not just in burst speeds for like a minute. They, uh, larval butterfly fish of the late stages have been found to be able to do that for 10 days. But they put them in a flume and found that they could swim that fast for 10 days straight before collapsing. At that speed and duration, that's the equivalent of swimming over 100 kilometers for 10 days straight. This tiny little thing. And so our minds have been blown about the capabilities of, of larval fishes in these early stages and um, the consequences of, of what can happen from that. And so to close up my last 10 minutes, I just want to talk about some of the work that we've been doing uh, with fish larvae here in Hawaii. And uh, you all remember 2014? It's a good year, right? It was a weird year. We had a bunch of hurricanes. Hurricane Cell almost hit us, but it got demolished by the Big Island, which was lucky. And we had one of the warmer warmer summers on record uh, where the whole North Pacific was really hot. And this is showing that the average sea surface temperature greater than normal. So the, the bright red is three degrees higher than it normally is. And so that shows anomaly. It shows greater than average. And Hawaii is down here where we're about one, one and a half degrees warmer than normal. So it's a very warm year. And what happened that summer was we had the, the biggest recruitment of coral reef fishes in recorded history of any location ever. And this is an example from Molokini. These are the, the black-lipped um, butterfly fish. In Molokini, they had three different drops 
um, which is what they call them. So all of a sudden, these, these larval fish just came out of the water column and settled on the reef. There were two events where it was about 10,000 or you know, tens of thousands of individuals that, that all came in one day. And then one day on August 11th, more than a million of these fish popped down. And so, whereas most of the time, most of them die, in a couple of these rare circumstances, a lot of them made it, and we're trying to figure out why. And they were just all over the place. And this was not just one species, but we saw exceptional, in fact, the, the headlines were biblical, biblical amounts of coral reef fish <laughs> settling down on the reef. Um, and so a lot of what I've been trying to do is figure out which species were the winners, what do they have in common, how can we figure out what's, what caused this incredible event, because it's, it's unprecedented in history. And so we got, there were a lot of the winners, um, the ones that had just really abnormally high numbers of settlers come to the reef, were a lot of the uh, surgeon fishes, um, the tangs and the unicorn fish and the yellow tang, a lot of the butterfly fishes, and a couple of random ones like the gurnards and the big eyes and the fantail file fish. And some of you might remember in, in the 80s, 1984 actually, there was a huge um, spawning and recruitment event of the fantail firefish that was file fish that was all about in the news. So that was a, one of these huge drops that happened in one species. And this is one that happened in dozens of species. And particularly these about half dozen or so were the biggest winners. And interestingly, what they all had in common were the spines. Yeah, so all of these fish had really big, elaborate dorsal and anal fin spines, some on the, uh, the gill operculum, and these really big head shields. Had the most success in that particular year have these really ornate spines that potentially allow them to escape some kind of size-specific predation. Uh, so some predator that ate everything else they were too big uh, and they survived. In addition to that, they, were, they also have in common the ability to delay their metamorphosis. So most organisms, they metamorphose as soon as they hit the substrate for a coral reef fish, for example. So they're a larva and then as soon as they hit hard bottom, they turn into a juvenile. But these winners had the ability to delay that metamorphosis and they could actually stay a juvenile in the water column and grow to a bigger size before having to come back to the reef. So the combination of those two things, the head spines and the ability to grow to much bigger sizes, relate, related them to be able to uh, recruit in these huge numbers. And so we're working on modeling those life history traits along with all the oceanographic uh, data that we have to be able to explain how this uh, incredible event occurred and why it happened in these organisms. And then the last thing before I close is uh, what I've been working on most recently, uh, which is looking at these um, features that are quite prevalent on the leeward sides of the island called surface slicks. If you guys have ever been out in the water or flown over on plane and seen these long kind of meandering parts of smooth water, um, fishermen have long known that these, these features house a lot of fish, that larval fish accumulate in there, and even marlin and mahi and things um, aggregate in these areas because they accumulate debris and then everything likes to hang out under debris. So fishermen have queued into these things for a long time and we've been wondering if they are really important for larval fish and might be a mechanism for them to stay close to shore. And so this is part of the, the West Hawaii Integrated Ecosystem Assessment, um, which on the Kona Coast has been established as um, a really important ecosystem that we've been trying to figure out how everything is all linked up and these slicks might be an important part of that because they converge a lot of material, both surface floating material like leaves and um, debris and phytoplankton and then larval fish like these little juvenile um, sergeant majors also get attracted to there and so in the fall we went out on a cruise and made a modified Neustadt net, which samples just the top one meter of the water column, and is able to tow along these features and try to sample the larval fish that's in there. So you can see here how it uh, tows off to the side so that we can sample that top surface water without disrupting it with the propeller. 
very difficult to drive with it. And then we also use these uh, vertical drop nets to sample the top 10 meters or so, so we can get an idea of what's at the surface and what's at depth and see if these things are important uh, nursery habitat for larval fish. And then we also are using the, um, these drones that the Marine Mammal Program uses to count monk seals to get aerial surveys of these, um, these features and be able to map out how big they are, how, how long, how they move. And then we can scale that up to the whole coastline scale and be able to actually model um, where these habitats are and if they're important, how they can affect uh, larval dispersal. So we sampled um, a whole bunch of slicks all around the Kona coast, and we found that there's they seem to be very prevalent around headlands, which headlands are also known to be sites of huge recruitment. So when there's recruitment measured along this coastline, the most recruitment, that is larval fish coming to settle as adults, happens along these headlands, which are associated with these features. And this is just preliminary data, but we've seen that of the samples that I've analyzed so far that larva accumulate in these surface slicks and there could be upwards of, of 10 times more larva fish inside of a slick than in ambient water right outside of it. So they do aggregate inside these things and they could be very um, prominent nursery habitat for a lot of different species. They also accumulate plastic because they accumulate all kinds of things. And this is an example of this was taken from one five minute tow. This is all microplastics. And so there's actually more plastics than fish in that sample. And there were a lot of fish. Um, so there's some interesting things there that we're trying to quantify and see how the plastics are interacting with uh, this habitat. But the last thing that I'll leave you with is the really amazing diversity of stuff that we're collecting in samples right off of shore. So when we're on some of these these uh, slicks that are forming right off of the shore, you could throw a tennis ball and hit the shore. So you're within within 50 meters. And we're getting larva of reef fish, of epipelagic fish like mahi-mahi and marlin and tuna, and even some of the, the deep sea stuff like swallowers and the dragonfish that are all interacting all together in the same sample right next to shore. So because Hawaii is, is so steep, because the islands drop off so rapidly, we get a kind of contraction of multiple different habitats all within the same area. And those larval forms, the baby fish of those different groups, are all hanging out together. So you can, you can get examples of a goby eating a baby tuna uh, because they, you know, if they're a couple days later in development. So there's, there's really crazy dynamics going on right here. And that's happening just right offshore here of, of Panama Bay. And with that, I just want to thank a lot of the photographers that had amazing pictures that, that I used for this, uh, Jeff Lyson particularly, and um, uh, the people that I work for. And most specifically, a special shout out to Bruce Mundy, who's uh, an expert in larval fish that I'm lucky enough to work with at NOAA. And you guys can get in on some of this uh, expertise because he runs the live um, analysis of the Okeanos Explorer. So when they drop an RUV and they explore a new habitat, Bruce is online narrating exactly what they're seeing. And so there's a lot of the adult forms of these juvenile fish. And, he, uh, and you can watch it live, you can watch the recordings of it. So check that out on Okeanos Explorer. They're about to go to the Marianas Islands in this month and they're going to see some amazing things and everyone can follow online. Uh, and with that, I want to thank you guys for coming here. Two questions. Two. Who's, who's cross checking you uh, from the level form to your uh, DNA? Uh, yeah, so the question was who's who's cross checking or how you validating what species are which? Um, yeah, DNA is, is, is certainly one of them. Um, and also, uh, people that have been able to rear these things, the, the rare times that they've been able to rear them, two of the best people that can do it are actually here on island. Um, and so, 
Uh, Frank Bash, for example, is, is one of those people who will collect eggs, collect pelagic eggs, and then rear them, and then document all those different stages until they turn into the adults. And then they can show the whole life cycle. And that is incredibly valuable. But we don't have that for most of these groups. A lot of it is just based on getting them at different life stages and then validating that with genetics. And so genetics in the last two decades has really helped to elucidate some of these mysteries, has corrected a lot of things where we thought, this is what we think blue tuna, bluefin tuna look like. And the genetics is like, nope, that's yellowfin. And so there's been a lot of those things, but there's still a, a lot of mysteries that need to be solved with combination of morphology and genetics. Yeah. Was that recruitment that you talked about just present on a couple of the islands, or did it hit a lot of the islands? And then it was a couple of years ago, does the reef in that area still have a higher number of fish? A really good question. Yeah, so it, it affected multiple islands, um, Big Island, Maui, and Oahu primarily. The Northwest Hawaiian Islands didn't seem to have they had slightly better than normal uh, recruitment, but nothing extravagant from what I've heard. Um, and there were also some other places in the Pacific, uh, in the South and Central Pacific, that had big recruitment during that period too. So it seemed to be kind of widespread, but focused on a few places. And um, good question. I'm actually not. I'm not sure specifically how Hanama fared, um, but I know like. Um, Kahe Point uh, had a lot of fish settle, and even in um, around Hawaii, Kai had a lot of fish settle. So Hanama could have been uh, affected, but I'm not sure specifically. And the second part to that is how well have things survived since then? And most of them died, uh, which is what happens in these kind of big pulses, is that there's so much competition for food when a million individuals settle on the reef that most of them die. But um, I think we'll probably see, once we look at the long-term data, that there'll be a kind of sustained pulse of adults. Uh, I mean, just snorkeling around afterwards, I could see some of the file fish that were hanging out for a while afterwards, and I'm sure people that have snorkeled frequently after that, you saw some higher levels than normal, but nothing crazy. So most of them died, sadly. Uh, so for all, those, uh, for all the features you were talking about, uh, at the very beginning, the, the eye stalks and the trailing gut and all that. And you said that they are lost in the adult form. Do they? What happens to all? Do they? Do they, do they just shed the trailing gut? Is it like they basically like self cauterize and, and just shred, and shed it? Or like with the eye stalks, do they shed those and grow new eyes, or do they like contract them back in? Like what's that's a, a great question, and uh, yeah, sorry for not um, clarifying on that. Yeah, the, none of them are lost, they're just retracted. And so you see in the final stages of them that the eyes get pulled in and the, the guts get kind of, you know, sucked back in like that. Yeah, and we only know it from discrete, you know, we get, we get one at 18 days old and it's sucked in and one at 21 days is completely sucked in, so it's kind of... We, we see these little glimpses, but yeah, that's what it looks like, is they're not lost, but they're just... And the, and the same thing goes for the, the gelatinous kind of like shell, like that gets sucked into the body too? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I would have thought it, if anyway, that would it would just It yeah. would just go. Yeah, I think there's valuable energy in there. I think there's yeah. valuable nutrients to try to reabsorb. 